Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their stories, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret, starting today. Today we have Dr. Anthony Balduzzi with us. Dr. Anthony Balduzzi is a health and weight loss expert and the founder of Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project, leading health and weight loss programs for busy men and women over 40. Dr. Balduzzi holds dual degrees in nutrition and neuroscience from the University of Pennsylvania, a doctorate in naturopathic medicine, and is a former national champion bodybuilder. Dr. Balduzzi is most proud of the, of the fact that he's helped over 60,000 families in over 100 countries lose weight and get healthy through his Fit Father and Fit Mother programs. Anthony, it's such a pleasure to have you here on the show with us. Welcome. Thank you for having me today. How are you doing? I'm doing well. And you know, this is fun for me. And I don't know if everyone knows the context of the backstory is you and I have been friends for a long time and we we're kind of recounting this and we actually went to medical school together yep. at the same time. So it's fun to reconvene with you here on this amazing show and platform that you do have to have a great conversation, just to see your smile and to hear your voice and your energy. I'm, I'm happy to be here, brother. Thank you so much, man. It's uh, again, it's such a privilege to reconnect with you. I remember when I met you in medical school, you were about, I think you were two years ahead of me in the program and you were mm -hmm. such, you are and were such a light. And I remember just seeing you and going, wow, this guy is inspiring. <laughs> I want to be like this guy when I grow up. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> and, yeah, absolutely. And so, I, you know, like I said, you're an incredible soul and I'm excited to share you with the audience and for, the, for you to share your story, the lessons you've learned along the way. And like they said in the beginning, anything you can share to empower the audience to create that extraordinary life without regret. So for my audience who isn't as familiar with you, they haven't heard your story. You know, I found that each of us is the hero of our own story. And we've experienced mm -hmm. challenges, setbacks, and adversities that we've overcome to get to where we are now. If you'd please share with us, what's your hero story? Okay. Well, I think we'll work backwards from what I do now, because it kind of creates a through line. As you mentioned in my bio, um, I run these two companies, Fit Father Project and Fit Mother Project, that specifically help busy parents in their 40s, 50s, 60s plus lose weight and get into fantastic health and shape. And I, I wouldn't say this is what I planned on doing as a kid. I loved playing basketball growing up. I was born in upstate New York, Syracuse, New York, and my parents moved around quite a bit. My dad had a busy job and we lived in Canada for some time and ultimately settled out in Arizona where I grew up for the majority of my life. What was unique about my upbringing, and I have a younger brother, Nick, and my mom and my dad, was that growing up, I watched my dad get very sick. He ended up getting cancer. I saw him the cancer diagnosis just whittle away all of his vitality and strength. And he ultimately died when he was just 42. That was just before my 10th birthday. I was nine years old. So I was gifted this, uh, I say gifted now because this is a perspective that I come from, this really powerful experience of losing a parent from a young age. And also, I guess, all the things that come along with that, a feeling of immense grief and sadness, um, an appreciation for how foundational health is to our lives, and a fire that I kind of had to forge my own path become my own man, and maybe on some level, like be there to be strong for my family after dad passed. So I kind of feel like I, I was a fire was lit inside of me from a young age. And that's not to say it was just like automatically, I had this tragic situation. And now I'm like fired up listening to Tony Robbins at 10 years old and like ready to like <laughs> manifest my dreams. It was a process and an unfoldment like all of our lives are. And mine largely unfolded from a young age through this vehicle of fitness. What I found out very early is that if I started to exercise and in my mind at a young as 10 years old, basically a couple months after my dad passed to get strong, to get strong. So cancer couldn't get me and to like really fire up my life. And I started training and focusing on fitness. And it would be as simple as just doing push ups, sit ups, and having a pair of dumbbells I hid under my bed growing up and starting to train as I trained. I began to understand some this experience of personal power. 
which I think is like the through line of our hero's journey. The idea that you can have some kind of obstacle and experience and you can use your inherent desire in your will to shape your actions to create some results. And for me, when I fitness, with fitness, when I began to run and my lungs were burning or do my curls and my pushups and my arms were shaking, I found that I was getting stronger and I was able to tap into the idea that I could push through momentary discomfort. And it actually ended up healing me too. I'm sure this was changing my neurochemistry at this time massively by investing in this exercise and it gave me an early sense of purpose in life. So I continued into high school and I went to an all boys Catholic high school in Arizona. And what that meant when there was no girls around, all we cared about was like do well in school and play sports. Um, so for me, I, I decided that I really wanted to get jacked. I looked at the muscle magazines and I wanted to be huge. I, I just was some, for some reason that captured my interest as a young man. And so I started to lift and train. Um, I became a personal trainer and ultimately I started competing in bodybuilding when I got into university. And through the bodybuilding experience, what I would consider almost like the next phase of my life, I went to a good university, I was a kid that studied very hard. And then I got very attached to my body attached to building it. In fact, to the point where you really shape your entire lifestyle around the idea of how do I maximize my muscle mass and minimize my body fat, and then actually take that body onto a stage side by side with other people and show it off to be scored by judges. It's a wild thing. And I loved it at that time. And so I did that and I became successful at that over the course of, I'd say the five, six years through my late teens and my early twenties. And one of my, well, I guess like a pinnacle achievement moment for me is when I went to university, um, I went to the university of Pennsylvania in Philly and they had a school bodybuilding show. And I told my mom when she was dropping me off to school that I was going to win that thing one day and I ended up competing and winning it twice. And so for me, I got this, these, these really interesting experiences through bodybuilding and excelling at a, a niche sport, if you will, at a young age that gave me a sense of confidence. And it also just really like built me up physically through that time. I got massively interested in health and fitness, as you can imagine, when you really do that much like bodybuilding. And, and that led me um, through a circuitous path to naturopathic medicine, which I found is like a medicine that was very based off of using the inputs that I was so familiar with sleep movement, the mindset aspects, like getting the body aligned to natural law. And then of course, all the things I didn't know were involved in the medicine, like these incredible healing modalities and just a general perspective of how to approach healing. It jived with me. I went to school, you and I meet. Now I'm in my final year of medical school. Um, I believe I must be like 20, maybe 26. I don't know how old I was, but whatever, whatever age I was. And I go on a ski trip with a dear friend of mine. And this was a couple of months before, you know, graduating. And I ended up getting in a crazy ski accident. Um, that day I was skiing very hard and very fast with my friend. And I had an intuition that I needed to slow down. And in fact, there was a moment earlier in that day where I almost crashed. I was skiing very fast down this run, kind of caught an edge on my skis and I flew into this mogul patch and I somehow caught myself, but I tweaked my hamstring and I was like, that's a sign I need to slow down. Except I didn't. At this time, I, I still had like a little bit of a, you know, I don't know, whatever the ego was, the idea of feeling that I was invincible and hard charging. And I just kept on ripping throughout the rest of the day. And towards the end of the day, there was a one particular run I'm skiing down that had a very steep hill, but a hill that if you skied fast enough at it, and then you jump at the top, you would float for like 15 feet and then land at the bottom. And so I did it once. And then I got back on the lift and I was going to do it again, bigger and badder. And the second time I jump off that thing and I do not land skis cross. I hit the bottom of that, that slope and they skis blow off and I'm just being thrashed 30, 40 miles per hour. I break my arm and I slam into a tree and my right leg basically explodes. It was like when I, when I kind of came to, and I think I had a helmet on or, or it didn't hit my spine, I would have died instantly with how hard I hit that tree. My leg was like backwards and sideways around this tree. And that was kind of the beginning of, of, I'd say like this next pivotal moment in my life. First one kind of being my dad and how that catapults me into fitness. And the second one is a, a near life ending injury. I go home after having two emergency surgeries and they were able to, you know, more or less save my, my leg at that time and life completely changes. I go through a tremendous healing journey and experience that was chiefly spiritual and secondarily physical. And what I mean by that is first and foremost, coming uh, into direct experience with all these emotions and thoughts that I'd had built up over the years. Attachment to my body, it is now destroyed. So looking at the feelings that are surrounding that and healing done around that. Um, acceptance of a situation that you caused, which requires deep personal forgiveness, as well as hope and faith that things can get better 
without direct, uh, you know, evidence in present for for that happening. Channeling the power of the mind and use in learning meditation to experience pain differently and to actually direct healing in the body. All of this happened for me in a very intensive 90 day period as I was finishing medical school. And this was a time when you and I were close friends. And as you mentioned, we had some deep conversations during that time as I was going through this like unfolding. And I would say it was a, it was a very much a, like what I would consider a positive experience for me. And it's probably because I had some skill sets from learning how to respond to tragedy of my dad passing that I was able to see this at a quicker time as an opportunity. And so I did, and, and, I, and I go through and I heal, and I heal quite fast. I heal to the point where, you know, I was in a wheelchair for a couple months and then crutches for a little bit, but I was able to like limp walk across the graduation stage, you know, 90 days after the injury. And it, what you wouldn't really call it walking, but enough so that I could load the leg and walk going from how blown up it was. That was a, that was a, that was a kind of a, a peak moment of that healing. And then I go throughout the, the rest of time after you get out of school, and I know you can relate to this, is like trying to figure out, what am I, what am I going to do? How am I going to serve people? How do I create a business? Um, and, and working so tremendously hard on that. And the culmination of my naturopathic training, my experience in bodybuilding, my undergraduate degrees in nutrition and psychology. Um, and then ultimately my personal story and journey I'd gone through of seeing what my dad went through led to the culmination of creating a business called the fit father project. And it was slow building, you know, doing to go online and get people to pay attention to you and to create something that is actually legitimately valuable takes a lot of work. And I worked this thing for probably close to a decade. And now I'm happy to say that we've built this up to a really amazing community and movement. Um, it's a multi-million dollar business affecting the lives of tens of thousands of families all over the world. And I'm just kind of sitting here like on the tip of the spear of this unfolding life experience, no longer feeling like this is mine but just the wave that kind of God has set me on and I'm, and I'm riding this and I'm here to spread love and to serve as much as I can and also see what my next chapter holds. Um, there's been repercussions from that leg injury. I'm still healing them today. I had surgery last week, the final one, six surgeries in six years to reconstruct my leg. I had to lengthen it. A lot of, a lot of crazy stuff happened there. And I just had my uh, firstborn daughter. Uh, she was born in March 18th of this year, 2022 recording. So I suppose in, in 10 minutes, I'm not sure how long that was. That is like the life journey up to this point. And it's been amazing. And I'm grateful to have the life that I have to experience what I have experienced and to share anything that may be of value and insight to people listening today. Yeah, man. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you so much for sharing so authentically and vulnerably. And there's a lot of parallels that I feel with you in our, in our life experience. And one thing that I have seen in my own life that I believe is the case for you as well, is that the tragedy that we both experience with the loss of a father, what that did to us and how that catapulted us forward and what we've done as a result of it. You know, in the, when I read your bio, you know, 60,000 plus families around the world have gotten benefited because of what you do. And that wouldn't have happened, let's say, maybe without dad. Yeah, And so it's like you honor your father immensely every day. And, you know, you've done such incredible, incredibly empowering, inspiring, life-changing work for so many people, mm -hmm. saved so many lives and it just nothing but respect for you, man. Thank you, bro. Yeah. And I'll say this, something that seems apparent when you say that, and I think it's true of all of our lives is we don't necessarily always choose our paths. Our paths are kind of like the situation, the cards that we are dealt. I didn't choose for my dad to die, but this was in my life experience. And, yeah. and I, to the, I own it and I, and I make it, it is, I accept and love what is, and then I move forward with it. So I think this is an interesting concept in transformation. And maybe we'll get into this there on one hand, you can read um, a lot of traditional personal development books that would suggest that you really have this, you, you cast from your mind this burning desire to create something and you develop a plan and consistency and, and you really work for it, bless it with action and a positive thinking and you work to really create this. That's almost like something that's coming from you. And, and I think that's true and can be done. It certainly was my experience with my business. But on the other side, there's many things in our lives that are almost like these, these pivotal moments and things that were just given to us. This is the exact situation. And I believe they're equally important. And, and I think when you have both these experiences and you embrace both what has happened and you allow that to guide you as much as what you choose to want to create and you allow that to guide you, 
you're, you have so much more power because it's almost like you're this, you're this man in this giant sea with a boat. And insofar as you can move the rudder, that's setting personal goals. And insofar as God is blowing wind in a particular direction, that's putting up the sail. And so I think that using the sail and the mind together is an important aspect of, of transformation. And what that often means is coming into the experience of deep acceptance of whatever has happened in our lives and like making that something that we embrace, not reject. And when you can do that, that's when you can start to experience adversity as fuel, as, as goodness. Like if the fundamental belief I may have is that I believe that all of this is unfolding in my favor and in my favor does not mean in the most comfortable manner possible or in the least painful way possible, but this is an unfoldment of my life experiences. I embrace fully and whatever it would happen and whatever will happen. And when we can live with less resistance in our minds and our hearts to what happens, I think that opens us up to this deeper dimension of experience that not only makes us happier, makes us more effective, but I believe is kind of like that spiritual line path that our, like our spirits are calling for. At least that's, that's what rings true to me. Absolutely. That was so well said. And it brings up in me, you know, this perspective, we talked about adversity and before we started this podcast, you and I had a short conversation and you had mentioned something similar, the idea that adversity creates the growth. And something that many people have said to me, and I'd imagine have said this to you at different points in, in the last couple of years, people have said to me when they hear my story as it relates to my dad, which is really the, the catalyst for why I do what I do over the last 10 years, they'll say, wow, you know, you really could have gone another way with this. You know, you didn't, you took this and made something really beautiful from it, mm -hmm. but you could have taken it a whole different way. And with that in mind, you know, you mentioned kind of the kind of general personal development kind of paradigm. And when we come from that space, it's like, okay, we get to decide the meaning that we give to a life situation. Yeah. You know, something happens and we interpret it and we experience the interpretation. Something I often tell my clients is that, you know, the way I think of it is life happens in three stages. This, is, this applies always, no matter what. Step one, life happens. Step two, you interpret it. And step three is you experience your interpretation. That's all that mm -hmm. ever happens. But the thing is, most of us, we kind of forget about step two. And we think life happens and then we experience life, but that isn't how it works. And so when we realize that something happened, okay, what am I going to make this mean? And something that I remember you mentioned Tony Robbins earlier, you know, I think he said around 10 or 10 or so is when you got into him and I discovered him at around 15. And something that I remember hearing him say was when the worst day of your life be can become the best day of your life, the game changes in, you know, in an instant. And I look back and I think, what I do now and all the people I've been blessed to serve over the last 10 years plus, and I think about the people that have told me they didn't commit suicide because of conversations that we had and the impact that was had. Well, none of that would have happened if I didn't go through those three years with, with my dad and taking right. care of him and then him ultimately passing away. And, and so when you talked about, we kind of get the cards dealt to us at certain pivotal moments, milestones yep. on the journey. There's this metaphor that I came up with a couple of years ago that I share with people of, you know, imagine you were a sword and you, you could speak. And so you, there you are in like the, the blacksmith place, <laughs> whatever the forge or whatever you call that. And the blacksmith picks you up and you're, you're very dull. And you say to the blacksmith, I want to be the sharpest sword in all the land. And the blacksmith mm -hmm. knows what that entails and you don't. So he says, mm -hmm. you, you sure you really want this? And you go, oh yeah, I want nothing more. And he goes, all right, cool. And he walks you over to that stone wheel you see in like the movies <laughs> and he starts spinning it. And you're like, what are you doing? And he grabs the, the sword. He starts putting you against the stone. Every time you hit the stone, there's a spark and like a bounce back. And you're like, ow, ow, ow. And you're sitting there saying to the blacksmith, why are you hurting me? Like, well, what's going on? What you don't realize that the blacksmith does in, the, in this story, the blacksmith is like the metaphorical equivalent of life or God or the universe, yeah. basically saying you want to be, well, let's say, you know, the best that you can be in this, in this, uh, in this uh, area, you're going to have to grow to get there. And that grow is The growth is going to be as a result of the hardship and the challenge and the adversity mm -hmm. that you're going to rise above. And yeah. so like when we can experience the challenge and the hardship, and see it in a different lens of how is this growing me? How can this serve me? How can I use this to not only help myself, but help others? All of a sudden, there's like a, almost like a purpose to it. And it's not, con yeah. at least in my experience, it's not condoning. It's not saying that I want it. Like you said, I didn't want my dad to die. I didn't want that experience to happen. In the moment, it was really miserable. 
But in hindsight, I look back and I, when I kind of, there's a Steve Jobs quote where he says, you can't connect the dots looking forward. You can only do it looking backwards. I look mm-hmm. back over the last 10 years. I'm 31 now. He passed when I was about 21, 22. And the aneurysm he had was when he was, uh, uh, I was 19, he was 40, uh, 49. Yeah. And so when I was 19 to now, I connect these dots and I say, wow, this wouldn't have happened. That wouldn't have happened. And one thing led to the next. And you just, when you can find the meaning in it and you can find out how can I use this to help other people? A, if you believe in what I'm about to say, you honor that person's memory for wherever they are right now, kind of looking down on you, let's say. But even if you didn't, in your own mind, at least, you're able to rise above what happened to you, like Anthony mentioned earlier, take it, use it as fuel to create the life that you want inspire other people to do the same, help other people mm-hmm. on their journey, make other people's life you know, easier and better. And maybe they don't have to experience the same challenge that you did. Like I know with the work you do, helping men and women lose weight, get healthier, you, you have likely prevented so many people from passing earlier th- th- than they were meant to. Mm-hmm. I, 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 if, I fra- if, if I phrase that properly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. And so- I'll, That was I'll, beautiful, beautiful input, yeah. Thank you, man. I would love to ask you, you know, when you were in your darker moments, whether it be around when dad passed or whether it be more recently after the injury, like you mentioned, having this attachment to the physical and the body, and you put so much time and energy and attention and effort into building it up. And then when it gets injured and there's certain things you can't do anymore, when you're in moments of what, maybe when you were growing your business, when you first graduated and and before, when there's doubt, when there's insecurity, when there's all these thoughts of like, can I actually do this? What messages and advice could you share with people who might be dealing with that right now? I would say that perspective when I was going through very tough times, it's often like really zooming things out of the big, will I be able to do this? And just working every single day with your action, blessing what you want to create. And so what that looked like for me when I was building my business is, you know, spending even more time investing and improving the different web pages and stuff that we're doing. These thoughts come up and you're able to observe them. And this is why I think practices like meditation are are important, or at least getting into the awareness and the experience of seeing your thoughts and not knowing that you are not those thoughts. I think that that kind of psychological distance between those things and psychological, psychological may or may not be the right word is a key step where you're no longer attaching to the thought itself, but you understand this thought is coming uh, is from a seed of a feeling of, of, of that you may not be able to do it, of doubt. It's coming from doubt or fear um, or some kind of like egoic lack. And so when you can start to see things that way, you can experience those. They come up into awareness, but you can still continue to act in the direction that you wanted to create. So like, I, I guess it's, it's like every kid learns how to walk because they don't quit. That's kind of like my experience. And, you know, I'll use the word every, you know, most people are able to because they don't quit. That was my experience with business too. When there was a lot of doubt and uncertainty that it would be able to get done when those thoughts uh, creeped up, it would be to continue to work the plan and have trust and continue to like create and add more value in the situation. So I think it's just like, literally we're blessing, we're creating blessings through our work and our action. If we continue to, to take um, actions in the direction of what we want to experience in spite of perhaps having momentary right now evidence for it. And we keep the faith. I think there's just so many powerful quotes about the idea of of faith and action without seeing results. And when you can do that, things start to work. And then when you can use your intelligence to look at things and and see how you can make improvements, if they're not moving in the right direction, things start to work better. It's not, it's like these overnight successes are 10 years of continuously, you know, investing and investing, investing. Now with the body, I think pain is a great teacher. Pain gets you into that meditative state of mind because you can be with pain, but there's a difference between experiencing pain, like nervous system sensation, um, and being in suffering, which is like, like, why am I experiencing this? Like, I reject this. I do not want this. So I think a good a good meta perspective is like, this is my lived experience right now. I am not denying what exactly is. I experience pain. I experience pain. There's a difference of that experience of the pain in in the rejection of the experience of the pain. So when you get to this, I think you can really go through life with a lot more flow and those negative thoughts and thinking don't pop up nearly as much. 
those are an experience of the mind, agitation of the mind and the feeling that come from this root of fear. And the more you can continue to like create that distance between that activity and that, you know, oftentimes negative or feel for patterns of the mind, those grooves get less and less. And as you continue to work and you start to see some traction, some results, a new pattern of, of thinking and experiencing can creep up, which is like, okay, something's happening here. Oh, I am getting a little bit better. Oh, this is working. And then the, the different chatter of the mind goes from being fearful and of doubt and uncertainty to one of possibility. And ultimately when that is expressed, even in a deeper way of flourishing. And then when we start to flourish and we're actually really like aligning, we're experiencing what we've been working on creating and we've worked this path more then flourishing ends up pouring into the bucket of service where we then begin, we have so much that we give to others and, um, and, and, and you not to say we couldn't be giving to others along the way, but it seems just a natural progression. When you get to the point where you experience something profound, like you have with your own work that you ultimately want to begin to ignite that same torch in others. And you just happen to do that in a very big formal way. But I think we're all doing this in different ways all the time. Love that. Love that. You know, the, one of the first things that came to mind when you began sharing that was it sounds like such a simple concept, but so many people, they're not even, they don't, they don't seem to be conscious of this because they identify with it. You are not your thoughts. You have thoughts. Yes. And yes. when people really sit with that, you know, that voice in your head, that thought that says, oh, like, I'm never going to make it, or I can't do that, or, you know, whatever your, 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 your top five are, <laughs> the, the go-to, mm -hmm. the greatest hits, those, that voice in your head, usually it's not yours. And what I mean by that mm -hmm. is, from my experience, there's not babies, and you, you can maybe attest to this because you just had a child, yeah. there aren't babies being born with the thought in, instantly embedded in them, I'm not worthy, I'm not good enough, I don't matter, like, yeah. this isn't going to work for me. It doesn't happen. We kind of pick it up along the way. We hear it from other people. We kind of learn it. And then it becomes a part of that neurology. And, yeah. you know, it's like that it becomes that voice. And all of a sudden, it sounds like your voice because it's repeated so many times. You mentioned those like kind of cognitive grooves in a way. It's like the mm -hmm. neuroplasticity side of it. But you can begin to habitual, habituate yourself out of it. And like you said, there's this confidence, confidence loop in psychology. Yep. And when we can come from that space, you know, for anyone who's not familiar with it, as you become more competent in something and you get better at it, you become more confident in it. And then as you're more confident, you're willing to take more and better and stronger action. And then you become more competent and then it keeps yeah. going and it keeps going. And it's the same kind of idea of like in, with money, like the rich get richer kind of idea. Mm -hmm. And so whatever it is that you want, like Anthony said, continue to bless it, continue to put your focus on that, which you want to create and keep moving in that direction. And whenever the thought yeah. pops up of limitation of doubt, Rather than doubt yourself, doubt your doubt. Mm -hmm. And when you doubt the doubt, you're able to keep moving forward. Just like, you know, an emotion passes, this too shall pass, that old adage. Yeah. Thoughts pass too, all the time. Yep. And yep. so when we can let them go, we can step forward. And like you said, into service, I find that when we are willing to keep in mind who else will benefit from whatever it is that we're creating, whoever it is that we're working on, whatever it is we're working on rather, we're far less likely to slow down, far less likely to lose our motivation. Because if it's just about us and it gets mm -hmm. hard and challenging and difficult, we might quit. Yeah. But if it gets yeah. hard, challenging and difficult, and you've got your family counting on you, or you've got a community counting on you, or there's, there's, there's groups around the world counting on you, whatever that might be, whether it's local, global, it's bigger than just you. So you're far mm -hmm. more likely to continue and to push on. Yeah. I mean, man, what beautiful input. I completely agree. And I think one thing you said, just to quickly go back to the confidence competence loop is even if we have the experience, the mind thought that I'm not worthy enough, I can't do this. It's not possible for me. You can still act in spite of that thought. Yeah. Like you can, you legitimately can. This is why having simple plans and having support, having coaches, like these things help you act in spite of those thoughts. And those actions are the blessings that kick you into this competence, confidence loop and start to go that I think you can apply that concept anywhere with when any area of your life that you want to effectively improve. And you said, I am not the thoughts. And I would also pause it too. In some ways, you could also say I'm not the body. You can say I have a body, I direct a body, I experience a body, but I am not the body. Yes. And what I mean, mean by that is these bodies change, you know, I think aging is an inevitability, whether or not you have a big injury, like, these bodies do change and attachments that we do have that naturally arise to these physical bodies 
um, can cause people a tremendous amount of suffering. And I think there's another dimension of life where you can just be with this exact experience with a lot more grace. You know, you see, I, I see this picture behind you and it looks kind of like it could be from like Okinawa, Japan in a mystical setting. And maybe there's like <laughs> some, some 120 year old Japanese woman living up there and her body is totally aged yet. She's completely at peace with the progression of the rise and the fall of the body and the return of the cycle of life. Like, man, there's a lot that can be said about these different perspectives. Um, and I, I, the, one of the biggest things, if I just have to be completely honest, that changed my life um, was meditation, and the, which, which I'm going to simply define as the practice of sitting down regularly in a straight back chair and like learning how to relax my body and experience my thoughts and ideally relax the thoughts too. But, you know, the, the observation of the mind, which is the very experience of being that's at the background of all that we do. We're always being, we're always aware that we are the awareness is, is the basis of this life experience. We could do nothing, communicate to each other about awareness. And if you can get into the practice of simply being and sitting then is very well documented, the activity and chatter of the mind can be observed and then it can be slowed down. And in time it can really like go away or be replaced with something that you feel like is a, is a different experience that feels better than just having constant negative chatter. So I, I just want to plus on that. I think it's one of been one of my deepest tools. And I don't feel that what I just described is in any way religious in any one type of particular religion. This is simply the observation of our experience with a relaxed body and mind and enabling these impressions that we've built up through all the attachments to our experience, which is a natural form of life seeing able those to see what those are with greater clarity and consciousness, as you may say, and allow those things over time as you just observe them to lose some power, lose that power they have over, you know, your attachment to it. And I think this is the nature of healing. This is what healing really is. And I'm not just talking physical healing, healing, but like emotional healing here is like, we've all gone through tremendous experiences and we've all created meaning. Like you said, the first step before what we do is how we interpret we've created meaning. And as we get more mature, we have the ability to like make more clear and intentional meaning. But oftentimes as we're developing these trauma, I guess, which you can often say is like a meaning that is, that we've held onto that has created like such baggage and hold and, and pain in us physically, emotionally, mentally, et cetera. And this, this process, I believe fundamentally, another one of my beliefs would be that in, through our own unique life experience, the combination of the cards we've been dealt as well as what we choose is a healing journey for each of us. And at the end of that journey is an experience of life that feels more abundant, um, that feels more connected, that feels predominantly loving, and, and is one that you want to serve others. I think this is kind of like an end point that we can all kind of move forward towards in our own exact unique ways, in our families, it doesn't have to be in this grandiose vision, but like we can align our lives more to that. And it's a process and it's an unfoldment. And there's a lot of trust involved in that. Mm. Absolutely, man. There's a couple of things that are really exciting right now coming up for me to kind of piggyback onto what you just shared. The first was I remember working out at a gym years ago and a friend of mine was there and she was being, um, she was bench pressing and a different friend was spotting her. And we talked about, you know, you are not your thoughts and the way you said it, that if um, you have a thought that says, you know, I can't do it, whatever it is, you can do it despite the thought. Mm -hmm. So I'm watching her bench press and this is what she's doing for anyone. You know, I'm like acting it out for anyone who's just on audio, but this idea she's benching and she's saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't. And she just kept saying, I can't do it, but she kept repping it out. And she repped out like six more. And every time I can't do it. And I'm sitting there wondering, is she aware of what she's even saying? Yeah. <laughs> the fact that she's doing it despite saying she can't do right. it. And how often do we do that in any area of our life, whether it be fitness or whether it be you want to ask somebody out on a date or you want to ask for a promotion or you want to you know, make some change in your business, whatever it is that I can't do it, I'm not capable. What, what if you just saw that as a thought, not as a fact, it was a perspective. Mm -hmm. yeah. And if it's a perspective, there's always another perspective and you yeah. get to decide which one you want to live with, which one you yeah. want to step into. And the beauty is no matter what you've chosen in the previous moment, this moment's brand new yeah, and you can sure. always pick another one. Yeah. And this other aspect that came to mind, you talked about, you know, not only are you not your thoughts that you're not your body. And I often share this with my clients because at the core of the work that I do, the essence of it is helping you remember who you really are. And this is what I mean by that. So, you know, I, the, the research that I'm about to, you know, has been updated since I first learned it, I used to believe that um, every seven to 10 years, we have a brand new body. Mm -hmm. the, actual, the updated research is actually about every year, which means every year or so, 
all the cells in your body are turning over all the time. And so every year or so, you have a brand new skeleton. You have, a, you have all your organs are different. Everything's brand new. And so if you were to, let's say, imagine, okay, so I, I took myself through this process and I'll take everyone listening through it and just see what comes up for you. And like Anthony said, nothing religious about this. This is just what I have found to be. I can't find anything more true than this. Yeah. So if I were to say, okay, who am I? which is a question that people have been with, you know, throughout the ages, who am I? And the first answer that came to me when I took myself through this process was, oh, I'm Jamil. And then I said, oh, but hold on, but what is Jamil? And I said, Jamil's a name. And I said, you know, I was born without a name and the name was given to me. So I have a name, I could even, I could change my name and then I could go somewhere and say my new name and that's all people know. They have no idea who Jamil is because I'm Frederick or, or whatever name that I choose, you know? And so, we come from that space of, okay, I have a name. I'm not my name. But the thing is that name, because of that, the, the neurology, we we're talking about the, the, uh, yeah. what was it? The grooves, this, we have this habitual patterned way of behaving and being. And so it's kind of associated with our name. So mm -hmm. the name carries with it, a story, a character, yeah. this is who I am. So other people see that and they say, oh yeah, that's Jamil. He's this way. He's not that way. And then if I act out of that box, they'll say, oh my God, that's so unlike you. Mm -hmm. Because they have me in this box that I am a noun, not a verb, right. when right. nothing's right. a noun, everything well is a said. process, right? And so from that space, I say, well, I have a name, I'm not my name. I have a personality, but it's clear in psychology that the personality is really developed in what they call the imprinting phase from zero to seven years old. And there's other stages after from seven to 14 and 14 to 21 and so on. But your personality is learned. And so when we realize that the personality is also like a work in progress, so I have a personality, I have a name, yeah. and then maybe I have certain beliefs, right? Whether they be religious, whether it be anything else. But there was a point where I didn't believe it because I didn't know about it. And yeah. there was a point where maybe I believe something else and then I stopped believing it and now I believe this. And then yeah. there might be a point where I stopped believing what I got now and I get something else in the future, yeah. but, but I remain. So yeah. now I'm not my beliefs, I'm not my thoughts. Thoughts just come and go. I'm the witness of the thought. Yeah. And then we say, okay, so all that's gone. But then we get to the physical and that's where it gets really cool because somebody might say, all right, but you're, you're this, like for anyone watching, uh, listen, I'm just touching my body. Like I'm this. And I might say, okay, how old are you? And they say, oh, I'm 30, I'm 50, I'm 70. And I say, cool. You have any memories from when you were a kid? <laughs> and then they say, oh yeah, yeah, of course I do. Tell me about one of them. Like one of the vivid ones. And they go, oh, there I was like eight years old, grandma's house, or this happened, my first roller coaster. And I say, cool, if you could close your eyes right now and imagine yourself in that memory as if it was now, like, could you do it? And they go, oh yeah, I'm seeing it right now, like a movie in my head, cool. So who was that in that memory? And they'll say, oh, that was me. I'll say, great, there's not one part of you physically that's still around now that was then. So who is the me that's aware of that? And the, the, the visual that I use for this is, imagine every year you get a new model of your car, an updated model. The car changes every year, but the driver is the same. Mm -hmm. So the question is, who's the driver? Right. And, that, and that's who you are. And depending yeah. on where you're, where you're from, and not really where you're from, but the, the, the belief rather, cultural, religious, that's soul, that's spirit, that's Brahma, mm -hmm. that's Atma, that's consciousness, that's awareness, yes. that's life, that's whatever you want to call it. But that's what you are. And when yeah. you realize that that is bigger than anything you'd ever experience moment to moment, mm -hmm. that you are bigger than anything that will ever happen to you. For me, at least, I don't know anything more liberating and freeing yes. than that because you rise above it. And it's like, it's it, to me, like I, it's incredible. <laughs> I'm going to pause because I can geek out no, on that dude, for hours. <laughs> that, that was seriously probably the best summation of that lesson that I learned that I've ever heard articulated in a short period of time in an engaging way. Yeah. I mean, that was the truth that I arrived at primarily through my leg injury, but there was obviously the buildup of all the attachment to come ultimately to see the light of that truth that you shared. That's yeah. been my lived experience. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. 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 And so before like really going off on a tangent, I want to bring it back to you, you alluded to, and you have this beautiful sign to your, to your right on the video of your, your businesses, your fit father project and your fit mother project. And you alluded to it in the beginning. If you can please share with us a little bit more about what those projects are about, how they support people and what people can expect if they want to join those. Yeah. So I, I came to the stark realization through largely through medical school 
um, of looking around and seeing that there was many people who are struggling, who are busy parents, who are, uh, you know, have had 10, 20, maybe even 30 years of, of a schedule that's put lots of pressures on them, not necessarily making the right kinds of food choices. We have such a huge incidence of obesity, all the metabolic syndrome conditions, heart disease. A lot of these are driven by lifestyle, right? And as I was attracted to naturopathic medicine, because for me, one of the coolest aspects of it is getting down and helping improve one's lifestyle that is enabled to like get the body back aligned to its healing innate abilities. And that comes down to changing the inputs and getting back to living in a way that was better for the body. And society today makes it very easy to do the opposite. Whether we have stressful jobs, we have disruptions to our circadian rhythm. We have a lot of convenience foods that are not good for us. We're not moving nearly as much. And we honestly just have families and a lot of busyness to take care of. I saw this as a massive problem. At least half of people you could say generally are experiencing some degree of this in the United States over 40. And I also had the experience of my dad, right? And in, in seeing, you know, he had challenges that were similar to that and all that were contributing factors to what he was going through. So I started to unwind, how would I go through a process of helping people do this, like gain their own personal power and figure out how to get their lives back on track. And I realized that people needed like actually simple solutions and some kind of framework that they could start working. The, they would need a simple plan, a plan that they can start to get on that competence loop and then also have like support around them while they're going through this incubation period of really like turning around their fundamental habits with their nutrition, their sleep, their exercise, their mindset. So over many iterations, it started off just as a meal plan. And then we added in age appropriate workouts. And then we padded this out to be like a real powerful learning experience in a community with coaches facilitating. So what it really is today now is, is like we're a community and a program that people can come and join anywhere in the world. We have members from over a hundred countries. You can sign up online, join and get walked through both with our team and with all the materials, the process of radically changing your nutrition to a, a way of eating that is simple, enjoyable, healthy, and balanced. That gets you out of the cycle of confusing diets and stuff that doesn't work long-term. A way of moving your body that starts to invigor reinvigorate yourself. And like, it's amazing how healthy you can get in your 40s, 50s, and 60s. Like we have, we have guys in their 60s who were literally like over 100 pounds overweight, hadn't exercised in two decades that can get six-pack abs. And it's not about the six pack. It's just, it blows my mind how powerful this body is to make changes like late into life. And yeah. 60s might even be a, a radical example, but like you can change your life and your body so dramatically in the span of six months to 12 months, you can become like a completely re reinvigorated, healthy person. You can get rid of your pain. You can get rid of your fat and, and you can get to a weight that feels good and comfortable and you can have a system that you stick to. So we did this for fit father and that really started to blow up like massively. Well, toot our own horn, but you know, in 2021, we were like, there's like this Inc. company that ranks the fastest growing companies in the United States. It's like the Inc. 5000. We were num number like 400 on that list. So just exploded. And, and what that really meant was we were just serving so many more people, which means bringing on more staff and more help, learning how to communicate our message more authentically and well on all the different online platforms like YouTube, writing blogs. And I don't know, for me personally, learning how to go from being a guy with an idea to actually someone who's like operating a business and running a business and, and all the things that come around, around with like being a leader in that structure. So that's Fit Father Project. And then there was demand a couple of years in from a lot of the guys who happen to have spouses or wives or sisters, or whatever. And they're like, hey, do you have anything for women? So we developed Fit Mother Project and that community has been coming up and it's been beautiful. We've been running Fit Mother for over three years now, Fit Father for, I think, close to eight. Um, so that's what we do. We help people lose weight, get healthy, build muscle. And it's really just a transformation journey. A transformation might be the right word. I, I found that if your health is a deficient area that you feel it is a deficient area, or you feel like there's something that you could move into that would be a greater expression of health that feels more aligned. Working with improving the physical body is one of the most powerful and immediate vehicles for really opening up and, and blessing the rest of your life and like improving everything. We have uh, so many dads who, you know, are on multiple medications, overweight, and after they lose the weight, they find that they're so much happier and more fulfilled. Their family interacts with them in a deeper way. They have a deeper sense of purpose and connection to their spirituality. This physical body, we have a physically embodied experience here as the awareness and the one that observes and, and effectively controls many of this experience. Um, once we get the body 
healthy and attuned, something happens where the mind and the emotions also start to improve as well. We hear the, the words body, mind, spirit in many contexts, and it makes sense to us. We feel like there's a cohesion that happens with these things. And what I've seen is without people wanting any of the deeper work, or at least knowing that they want by simply going through the process of improving your body and going through the transformation with that, a lot of this other stuff opens up. So then what is fit father, fit mother? Well, for a lot of our customers, it is a renewed way of life. It is walking a higher path. And it just starts often from clicking an ad uh, being like, are you a dad over 40 who wants to lose some weight? Come join us, right? But this is what life is full of surprises and adventures. And we, we help people who are looking for help with their health and fitness after 40. That's so wonderful, man. I got, I've gotten to check out both of the websites several times and seeing the photos on there of the transformation, the before and after, you know, inspiring isn't even the word. Like, I remember it, I have, looking at my phone and seeing this transformation of this guy I lost over a hundred pounds. And I, I instantly just, just came out of me. I was like, awesome job, brother. I'm just talking to my phone because <laughs> I just yeah. saw that. I was like, wow. It's like my spirit just like instantly yeah. recognized him of like the effort and the commitment and the work that yeah. he put in to make that happen. And, you know, something that you just alluded to when I was talking about this idea of, you know, and then you alluded to as well that, you know, we have a body, we're not a body, but that doesn't mean which some people make it mean that the body doesn't matter. Yeah. <laughs> we have a body, but this body is like, you know, I thought about this the other day, this idea that, so I have a house mm -hmm. and this house, you know, the four walls and the roof and the, the floor and all that kind of stuff. Well, that's great. Protects the body from the elements, all that kind of stuff. But, you know, let's say I could move, right. I can travel across the country, across the world. So my real house is my body. That's my home. That's is where I go everywhere yeah. with this. So that, mm -hmm. and then, so my experience is filtered through yeah. this, so it's like, how do I feel in my body? How's the energy? How's all these wonderful things? Am I in pain? Am I in bliss? Like whatever I'm experiencing. And so when we can take care of our body and love it, you know, you can, you can refer to it like a temple, like it's your vehicle, yeah. like it's whatever it is for you, but this is your home. And so are you taking care of your home? And so just, again, want to acknowledge the work you do. And it was a wonderful description right there of Thanks. it. And yeah, I'll make sure to have all the links in the show notes to how they can find that and would absolutely recommend everyone to get on, get on Anthony's programs. And so what have you found to be the primary obstacles that either, you know, men or women have shared with you and your team that like, this is why they are in a way like hesitating to move forward, hesitating to get started. What are those obstacles, those blockages, those beliefs of, well, maybe I can't do this. And like, could you speak to that for anyone listening who's maybe on the fence? Yeah, I would say, First and foremost, I think a lot of people, the clients that we serve have had a history of failure with yo-yo diets, with unsustainable plans. They've tried and failed many times. And it's not that they've necessarily failed. They just haven't had a system and a structure that's helped them blast through the initial inertia that exists when you're making a big life change, something foundational around like changing the food you eat. Like this is one of the things we do most consistently for our whole lives is we're having meals unless intentionally fasting throughout the day. Let's say we have three meals per day, seven days per week. That's 21 things that we're doing consistently. And there's deep habits and patterns that people have around those things. Um, and it takes work to change those. It takes having a new plan. It takes assessing that there's going to be effort and time required to change the things that are bought to figure out things that I do like to eat during these times, and then to actually work and start to build the habits and the momentum around that. There's a lot of inertia because it's not like we're ever making transformation in isolation. It's not like, oh, this is the only thing you have to do right now is we're going to take three months off and just have you focus on your health and fitness. No, this is like the eye of the storm. You're doing this while your job is still going, while your kids are still going, while there's everything happening in your experience. Um, and, and, and so I, I suppose the art of really succeeding and helping people with transformation needs to respect all of that, work with it, and have a way to kind of cut through the noise. One thing we do with our program members that I believe is as foundational, it's my belief, and it's also, I've had, I've interviewed maybe over a hundred of our members on a podcast we, we had this past year, and they tell me this as well, is one of the first things we do is we have them go through a deep reflection and journaling exercise before they even read the meal plan that helps them arrive at creating a mission statement. And what that mission statement reflection process does is helps them get very clear on what they want and why it's so important to them. We're creating new neuro associations and helping them discover their deep, powerful reasons for wanting to make this change. 
and also being very aware ahead of time that there's going to be costs involved. There's like these kind of sacrifices and prices you may, you must pay on your hero's journey. If you want to move from A to Z, right? The sword that's getting sharpened by the grinding stone, that is the cost of becoming the sharpest sword in the world. Insofar as we must also be making part of these sacrifices of the habits and the stuff we've been doing that's no longer serving us. We must kind of like release those and it's not always comfortable. So your mission and your deep connection to the emotion behind why this is, and like you said, it's oftentimes not just ourselves, it's our, it's our families, it's other around us, our communities. We do things and we find meaning when it's often greater than just our own personal journey. It's kind of expanded out to a connection to something larger. That's what we help our members discover. And for fit father, fit mother, oftentimes people get healthy because they want to be around to see their kids and their grandkids grow up, right? It's not about the six pack anymore. And we're okay with a little bit of knee pain. You know, this is a natural experience of the body that, that often happens. And I just share those specific examples to say that getting the mindset component right, right off the bat, a lot of is key. And a lot of people have misconceptions going into this game that they think they just need to like go on a diet or start a new workout kick. Like those are tools of the trade that are being wielded by the operator and the operator needs to kind of get aligned and really behind this so we can align the mind and the emotion with the action and that's what helps people succeed and the the thing is if you do, if you miss a couple of these elements it's so hard to break out of the gravitational pull of this early thing so we, that's why we get very intense we're like this is a 30-day focused experience is our front-end program you're doing this in community with coaches and we're putting a lot of focused energy in a short period of time to help you upstart and, and really get the gear moving in the right direction. And that seems to work. I can't say it works for everyone. Like it's not like every single person that signs up for a program is massively successful, but we have a large majority that are. And that's yeah, yeah. saying a lot considering, you know, just buying something online doesn't mean you're going to read it or, or, you know, you know, get involved with it necessarily. Yeah. I think it just speaks to this idea that, you know, the plan works, but are you working the plan? Yeah. Right. And it's that same, we all have reasons for why we may not at various points and the book kind of an, an uh, analogy you just kind of alluded to so many, I've heard that the majority of people who buy a book don't read past chapter one. Now I haven't verified that. So if it's actually, true, I can verify, I have a bookshelf of books I've never read <laughs> and I love them. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have some of those. And so this, this idea that, okay, I read it, you know, in this case, I bought the program. But then I didn't follow up with it. I didn't have the consistency with it. And there might be a rationale of, well, why not? And for everyone listening, think of it like this. If you want to increase the motivation for doing something, get really clear. How is this actually going to benefit my life? And how is it going to benefit the lives of others? And think of it like an old school scale. Yeah. And you have the two sides to it. Yes. And when you keep stacking the, the deck in your favor yes. on wow a year from now six years from now i'm going to walk my daughter down the aisle i'm going to be with my son i'm going to do this i'm going to do that and then you know i'm going to i'm going to be able to have grandkids or whatever yes. the dream or the vision is it, it excites you so much and the motivation shows up but the motivation doesn't always happen first sometimes yeah. the motivation happens along the journey Correct. And we do that. We call that, we call that in the, in the mission statement, future casting, like future casting out the beauty that you have, as well as connecting your uh, connecting health, the value you want to establish with all the other things you already care about. So like, let's say you do care about your family. Let's say you do care about your finances and let's say you do care about some other category, maybe spirituality. How does your health directly relate to all of those? How does it help you earn more money and be more productive? How does it help you be a better parent or be a part of a family in a deeper, more meaningful way? How does it help you with your spiritual connection? And we're creating neuro associations with values that we already are consistent with because we have this consistency bias where we want to be consistent with the things we kind of believe. It's a bias of the, of the mind. Um, and if you can tie health to those things you already care about, it creates a deeper cut of that. And we're also, we do legitimately use the other side of the coin too, or future casting out the pain. I think there's a carrot and a stick concept, right? And they're both very motivating what could happen on the positive or on if we don't change. And I think for a lot of guys, fear can be a great momentary motivator. So many men, I'll pick on men in particular, because there's a rampant heart disease in men and like get healthy after their first heart attack. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can actually get, get to a point of using some fear is a motivator, um, fear, fear in terms of like seeing things how they are and how they could get, if you don't make changes is also a motivating part of the process. When you're like, I absolutely don't want to go back there. 
mean, talk to anyone who's gone through a successful drug rehab process. It's not the, it's not the boon of a great life that's keeping them sober. It's that they know the depths of hell that they've gone through and they don't want to go back. So I think if we can get that serious about uh, our health, if that's an area you want to focus on, now you have a tremendous wellspring of power. And I think it's also good to have grace to understand that not everything is always going to be topply important. We have a lot of different desires of things we might like to experience, but I think to quote Tony Robbins, he's come up a couple of times as we meet our musts, like the things that we must get done that we feel so compelled on a deep level to get done. We get those done because we have emotional power. Like for many parents, it's like, I must feed my kids. Like that doesn't typically like not happen. It, it happens. And sometimes it happens at great cost or, or, you know, you get, you get the point here. So how can we make our health a must if it's a deficient area for you? I, I would invite you to really explore that and work into that just because it's going to give you so much benefit and it gives you lasting power and a body vehicle that can stay around for another 10, 20 years of experience can experience so much more serve so much more. Um, and just look ahead at what's happening to so many people right now at the end of their lives who haven't taken care of their bodies, who've had insulin resistance for many years, overweight, bad cardiac health, like life at the life at the end, if you don't take care of this body vehicle can be very tough and challenging. It can be an experience of losing your mobility and your ability to do many things, you know, losing your ability to have any exertion because your cardiopulmonary system is so bad, having dementia and Alzheimer's largely linked to like blood sugar dysregulation, insulin resistance, uh, so many factors, right? I mean, that could be the end of the life experience, or we see the contrary of these people who are in their eighties and nineties who have like fantastic vitality, who are still able to like move and enjoy who aren't in pain. Uh, and many of them didn't like weren't that way their whole lives, they created that. So I think it's good to see those models of promise of what could be there. I'd say that probably be like my health goal is I would love to, and especially recovering from these injuries, treat my body with the utmost love and respect, you know, physically by being smarter about the things that I choose to do um, and, and, and the intensity at which I do them, but also nutritionally and with my exercise so that I can have high vitality into old age. Like that seems like a really, really good goal. Yeah, man. I love that. And it brings to mind, I saw this online, I think about a year or two ago. And apparently there was this kind of survey done on, I forgot where, where it was. And it was a college campus. And they surveyed all these, these 20 something year old uh, you know, people. And it, the, the question was essentially, do you want to live to be over 75? And a large amount of them said no, but their reason was because the story that they have is that once you hit 75, it's all like downhill. But the thing is, like you've alluded to, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, I remember hearing about, you know, I, I enjoy running and in the past way more than the present, but, you know, I used to be a track runner and I did all the cross country and all these things. And I heard about this guy in India. I came to New York and he ran the New York City Marathon. He's 104 and wow. he did uh he did it in like five hours or five and a half or something like that, which is amazing. There was, when we were in Arizona together, there was a guy, I didn't get the opportunity to meet him personally, but I read his book and he was, I believe the oldest man in the United States. And he was 114, lived in Mesa. Wow. And, you know, his wife's like 90 something. He takes care of her. He's the cook. He would get, he'd go out and he'd give little seminars and lectures. And if you see a picture of him, the guy looks like he's in his eighties probably. And mm -hmm. you're just like, he's born 1901. And Dang. you sit there and go, wow, like, this is amazing. Now, somebody could say, well, that, those are exceptions to the rule. And it's like, okay, yeah. Is it true that there's a genetic component? Yeah, there is. And is it also true that you've got some power too in the choices that you make in the day to day? Sure. Yes. Yeah. And like something you and I learned from, you know, in school, this idea of genetics might load the gun, but environment pulls the trigger. Yeah. And it's like, how, what decisions do you make day by day? You know, Anthony mentioned earlier with your nutrition, with your sleep, with your exercise, with your, your mindset, how you respond to things, all these different areas of the physical health and the mental and emotional, how do you choose to live your life? And when you realize it doesn't have to be like old age is some, you know, it's, I almost said death sentence. It kind of is. Yeah, it is <laughs> but, death sentence, but, but, but it doesn't need to like, there's this slow, like, painful death. dying sentence. Yeah. Yeah. It doesn't like, have I, to be that. I remember hearing Denzel Washington say, um, it might, I think it was him. Yeah. He said, uh, you know, you can't help getting older, but you don't have to get old. Yeah. You know, old is this like mindset. I'm, you know, my grandmother's 86. You see her, she's got the energy of like a 40 or 30 year old, and she's got so much joy and youthful, you know, vibrancy. And people see her and they say, oh my God, like I, I want what you have. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the thing is, though, it's also, she's experienced a lot of hardship and challenge mm -hmm. in her life. It's not like nothing's happened to her. She's had her injuries, she's had all that stuff. 
but the outlook and how she chooses to see life and the perspective she relates to the situation, it changes so much. And there's also a lot of evidence to show that, you know, we mentioned earlier, your body's always turning over, but somebody might say, all right, but I've had this condition for like 20 years. So why do I still have that? And there's a whole conversation there, but one aspect of it is the psychological side of it, that you believe that like, this is who you are and you have this and you're so attached to it. And there's some evidence to show water can have memory and it like passes on in a way, like the story to the new mm -hmm. selves. And the, when you are able to let go of that, I remember listening to Dr. Joe Dispenza and one of his um, kind of podcast interviews. And for anyone that doesn't know, you know, he's a chiropractor, does a lot of work. He's also a neuroscientist, does a lot of work in that field. And he'll have an, a live event and somebody's blind for, you know, their whole life or they're in a wheelchair for the last 40 years. And in four days of doing all these meditations and things that he's got going on to help you shift that story, the person actually walks. And it's like, people don't believe that because they think that's not possible. And then he's got all these documented cases and studies. And when the brain and the consciousness shifts, it's like, it's like this downstream effect in yeah. the body. And yeah, yeah, there's so much there to unpack. For sure. But, um, you know, the, the foundation of this show, Anthony, is to help people create an extraordinary life without regret. For everyone who's you know, here with us, what advice would you have to help people do that? I think a couple of things first is to do that. You must turn inward and get clear about what it is that you do want to experience, like really get clear. And which means giving yourself the space to get clear about what, what is calling, what is the call of your spirit here to experience is that greater health and abundance? Is that a pivot in a relationship or in a, in a career? Um, is it, a, a drive towards inner peace and to like to, to, which means paying attention to our internal environment and not living as much in the external. We must act, we must work, we must do, but first that, that outward action must be informed by inward knowing and getting connected to what we want to have. And I think with the card thing too, it's like the card analogy we had, whatever cards you are dealt, you own those, those are your cards. You were given these cards. These are your cards to play. Play those cards and see where it unfolds. I think another thing I would share is to pay attention deeply to your intuition, which is the inner turning. I believe it's like the, the inner intelligence and the knowing that kind of can guide us from the inside. It's a personal experience of, of knowing and unfolding. And you can get more in touch with your intuition over time through practice, through all the stuff we pretty much discussed on today's call, the knowings and realizations on certain levels of who the I am is through taking care of yourself, through spending the time to um, get into relaxation, journaling, personal development work, whatever it is for you. Once you ultimately get in touch with the intuition, then you do not need to be a prisoner as much of living through the the active part of the mind that also is the same part of the mind that has fears and insecurities and uncertainties. You can live life through a place of more knowing and more trusting and more allowing versus feeling like the stress to necessarily like have to figure things out. So I think it's like this, I've heard this word, my friend says, this is inner standing instead of understanding, but this inner standing can inform our actions, which means to be there and to operate from that place, we must get clear on what that is. So turn inward through whatever practice it is to get deep and, and then work every day as, as a chance to bless the creation of that through your own thinking, through your own actions and to live um, with whatever you directly perceive to be true and to be of, of whatever higher vibration that you're called to like do yourself. I think we all have this kind of inner sense of like, what, what is true and base your life off of that, which I would also say is to kind of on a little caveat there without opening another can of worms. I think it also is practicing the art of telling the truth, like speaking the things which you experience as true, which I think is a very healing and purifying process. And it was for me um, to start to tell the truth and to clean up your language around that, because I believe that's one way that when you start to speak things that you authentically perceive as true and maybe even giving up all lies, white lies, whatever these kinds of things, then you have a deeper connection 
uh, into your internal knowing and you can operate a little more effectively. That is what I would say a slice of my spiritual truth and understanding. So take of it what you will. If there's anything that resonates with you, these are the bits of advice I would give um, in addition to everything that uh, I've covered and certainly you've shared very beautifully many times throughout this combo. Thank you, man. That's so awesome. You know, I love the inner standing idea. It reminds me of just that simple adage, you know, know thyself. And then if you add on to it, you know, be thyself. If something is calling to you, something speaking yeah. to your spirit, there's something that's exciting you. You're like, that feels cool. Like yeah. that would be awesome. There's something there for you. That's why it's enticing you and exciting you. It's not having that effect on the other guy next to you or the girl right. next to you. So what if we were to follow that and trust and have faith yeah. I, I think he's uh, kind of bringing it full circle. I think I'm alluding to something you said earlier in your healing process with your leg, this idea that having faith in the process without necessarily kind of, it's kind of the definition of faith without knowing, you know, like what's yeah. going to happen. And so with that same idea, know yourself, get really clear, like, who am I really? And what do I stand for? And what are my values? And what's important to me? And what kind of difference would I love to make in the world for my family, like just for myself, like what kind of life do I want to experience? And then tune in and slow down and listen to that internal voice, like the, the voice that's letting you know, go this way, do yeah. that. And then what would you, what if you treated it like an experiment and you said, you yeah. know what, I'm going I'm to try that. Pull and, that thread, just pull that yeah. thread and see where it goes. Yeah. Keep yeah. on pulling with that same quality of curiosity, love, trust, faith. And the adventure you will go on, I think is going to be absolutely incredible. Yeah. Part of it is going to be the adventure you're choosing to steer the boat. Part of it will be the cards that you were kind of dealt, but you're pulling on this thread. And I believe we can do that until our final breath here. Like that could yeah. be the entire journey. And maybe that's the only thing we really need to do. There's work that's involved when you pull that thread, but like, that's it, man. That's my understanding of how this mm -hmm. is, what this experience is. Yeah. There's a quote that I've shared probably like 10 times on this podcast so far, uh, not this episode, but each episode, all, all of them together, but it's a Martin Luther King Jr. quote. And he says, you don't have to see the whole staircase, just take the first step in faith. Hmm. And when yeah. you, it, imagining this staircase, and it's all shrouded, except for the first step. And so, so many of us go, I'm afraid to take the first step because I don't know where the staircase goes. Yeah. But in using Anthony's example of, you know, pull the, pull the thread, it, it's, it's kind of pulling you also in a certain yeah. way. Yeah. And so there's that staircase and you only see the first step, but you're kind of scared. But recognize you could always take the first step and then go back. And so take the first step and then see what happens. And what happens is the second step shows up and that also is exciting for you. And you follow that one. And like you said, it can lead you on, or not even can, it does. It leads you on this adventure that you probably couldn't have foreseen. It, it's yeah, just, your limited <laughs> mind could have not have dreamed up what would be possible in the infinite collision and possibilities of your life and your desire interfacing with all of this, all of this giant happening, right? Yeah. It's incredible. And then you don't have to have as much figured out and you can live with a lighter heart. And I think that also keeps you alive longer too, when you're yeah. not worrying about things as much. <laughs> and so as we wrap up, I just have a few final questions for you. You know, given the work that you do, given your life experience, all the challenges you've experienced and overcome, the lessons you've learned, if you were in your final moments and this was your last opportunity to share and help anyone listening, what would you want to make sure that, that they knew? I, I would make one statement. Um, I would make one statement and this would be what feels true to me now after this, uh, through this journey I've gone to. And I would say, glory be to God. Hmm. And that would be the last thing I would say, because that's been, when my experience is kind of in the culmination of all of this that we've described has been this deep personal experience of, of God, mm. which may be, you know, we've labeled in many different ways, this life process. It's a God experience through knowing oneself. Um, I don't know. It's, I guess it's a, it's a, it's a personal experience that I have that I believe I, I stand on as the truth of what's happened and what will continue to happen. And that's, that's what I would share. And, and I think that's been said in many different ways in many different cultures throughout the ages. And I think that's the, the right final message, at least as a capstone of, of my life experience. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. And what is the biggest risk you've taken or decision that you've made that you're deeply grateful for and why? You know, I, I guess I didn't really perceive it as much as a risk when I started my business at a young age. 
um, because I was just so I had a I had a fire that I knew this is what I wanted to do and I was going to figure it out. But it took me a long time to see success. I don't think I really made any money and probably lost money for like a long, long, long time. Um, you know, it was small scale, so I'm not like hemorrhaging. I didn't have a family or something to support at the time, so it was possible to like live off very little and not not do that much. But I would say directing my career path in a way that it was self-directed off of this life experience in a way that I could use my mind and my creativity to create valuable solutions to help people. Like that was a big leap. And I'm very grateful now being in my thirties to be able to have the life that I do have a life that's designed around service and adding lots of value and being compensated in a big way for that. Like that was a leap that I've, I've thing that many people spend their most time doing working. I've, I made it in a way that that is very joyful for me. I think there's entrepreneurship is not the way for everyone by any means, but it'd be hard pressed to say that it would be an enjoyable life for me if I were not spending my time in a way that felt good or at least of service. So that's what I'll share. Yeah, that's wonderful. And such a great way to wrap up this idea that for everyone listening, if there's a dream on your heart, some a business, let's say you'd love to create a service you'd love to provide maybe you're in the early stages of it and maybe kind of like Anthony said, you're hemorrhaging <laughs> or maybe you haven't started yet and you've got some fear around it. But notice, you know, like so many people who've created beautiful success for themselves and for their families and for the world, they didn't start with the success. They started with a lot of failure, if you want to call it that. They started with a lot of stumbling blocks, stepping stones along the way, positive iterations, spiraling up continuously, try it, fall on your face, learn something from it, keep going. And it's like, yeah, we all are on different points. You know, he didn't have a family when he started, neither did I. Now, maybe you do if you're listening. And so maybe you might have to start a little bit slower or differently, or there's a different way you're going to handle it, but there's always a way to pull it off. If it's on your heart, what if you came from that space as a possibility, it's on your heart for a reason. Mm -hmm. And yeah. what could be possible, like Anthony said, if you follow that thread and how different could your life be one year, five years, 10 years from now? Because when you mentioned earlier, it's amazing how physically things can change six to 12 months, you know, how, how much it can change. Well, that's the case in business. That's the case in relationship. That's the case in every area of your life. Every moment's brand new. If you decide to start changing the input, the output has to change. And when we do that consistently, it's almost like the metaphor of when you hit the golf ball. And if, you, if there's like two versions of you, they both hit the golf ball, but one of them kind of tweaks the wrist a little bit in a different direction. Mm -hmm. They start off in the same, you know, kind of path. And then over time, they end in dramatically different areas, pretty much the opposite area because of the spin, mm -hmm. because of the wrist being in a different position. It's the same way that there's a version of you now. And just for the sake of like illustrating it, there's this parallel reality of you also. And the, the you over there is going to keep making those decisions that might lead to the bad, you know, quote unquote, future that you don't want. And the one now in this reality is going to say, you know what, this is my wake up call. I'm going to start making the shifts, however small, but I'm going to do it every single day, one foot in front of the other. But you fast forward to the end of your life. And what's coming up for me now is this quote that um, is perfect to end it with. It's um, the definition of hell. And it's, it's one definition, but the idea that on your last day on this earth, the person that you became meets the person you could have been. And when I first heard that, it was like, I had shivers throughout my whole body, just imagining me not taking care of myself physically, mentally, emotionally, not following my heart, not pursuing my dreams, not doing the things that I wanted to do, just being kind of miserable and being 80, 90, however years old. And then this guy walks in who's, I'm, I'm, a, I'm on my last like minute of life. And this guy walks in, same age as me, but just shining, radiating with health. And he's made this impact in the world and he's helped so many people and he's genuinely happy and like, he's just full of love. And, I, and it's me. And I can't say like, oh, he was lucky or fortunate because like, it's me. And it's like, well, how did you do that? And his response is basically, you know, every time that you wanted to go right, but you went left, I went right. Like I followed that thread, yeah. you know? Yeah. And it's like, what if as a possibility we lived into that? And so Anthony, is there anything right now you can share with us that's exciting you that you're working on? Um, do I have to share more? I mean, I'd be happy to yeah. end it because I think that was like the way to end, man. I don't want to talk yeah, about perfect. any personal details past that. Like perfect, beautifully said, man. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So then the last part then is how can our listeners learn more about you, connect with you, work with you, anything you'd like to share? 
Yeah. Well, this was really fun. First off, like you have a depth of wisdom in a way and very articulate and it's been really enjoyable for me. Um, my companies fit father project and fit mother project are ways that you can get in contact with us. If you want support with your health or just want to check out what we're doing and just see what I've described today. The websites are fitfatherproject.com and fitmotherproject.com. We also have YouTube channels you can check out or just like Google search us. Like we're all over the place, have lots of good stuff. And there are ways to join our email list. We can send you free meal plans, free workouts. If you're interested in seeing like our methodology and all that, like that's a cool thing to sign up for. And um, there's also contact forms on that site that you can get in contact with me if you listen to this and you really did enjoy this and you just want to like drop a note or ask a question or something like that. Both sites have contact forms that will come to me and uh, eventually, and I'll get back to you. Perfect. I'll have the links to everything Anthony shared in the show notes. And again, just truly, Anthony's got my highest backing and recommendation. He's an awesome, awesome guy with a beautiful heart and a desire to serve people. And if this has resonated with you, whether it's for you, maybe it's for a parent, maybe it's a friend of yours, but point them in the direction of one of those websites. I think it'll really, really help. And if you've enjoyed this conversation, I encourage you to please leave a review whether it's on Apple or Spotify, wherever you're tuning in, really goes a long way. Please share this episode with anyone that you believe this can help. And Anthony, before we close, anything else you'd like to say? Thanks. No, this was thanks. great. I enjoy this. These kind of conversations, I believe, are like really special. And I will share too that it it makes me it brings me great joy that a lot of the stuff that I've described as my authentic experience has been something that you've resonated with, and it's been your authentic experience. And it's a really cool thing to listen for me in this conversation to hear you share some profound truths that are like, I'm able to sit here being like, that's what I've been going through like that. Mm-hmm. And like, thank you for the gift of, of that recognition and hearing it from someone else. I really enjoyed that. Awesome. Man. Thank you. I've enjoyed this so much. You know, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers experience more happiness, peace, and fulfillment as they create an extraordinary life without regret. If I can be of support to you, if you'd like to have a conversation, maybe you're going through something challenging or maybe everything's pretty good right now, but you'd love to create that dream rather in 10 years. Let's do it in 10 months. Let's have a conversation. You can schedule that at jamilsayage.com. You can also check out my Instagram, my Facebook, my LinkedIn. It's at Jamil Sayage, Facebook and LinkedIn and at Dr. Jamil Sayage on Instagram with his DR and then my name. All the links will be in the show notes in addition to everything Anthony shared. You know, this podcast is called Transformation Starts Today. And I called it that because most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow. And that's why they stay stuck. But you can be different. You can take our conversation. You can pull out the nuggets. You can re-listen to it. And you can take that one action, whatever that is, however small it is, take that one action towards the direction of the life you'd love to create. And your life will change before your very eyes. Sending you so much love and wishing you the best. Take care. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.